There's a lot going on up here at the moment. Um, so I'm just trying to process how I'm, how's, how's it going to come out. Uh, um, the first thing I want, I, my, the prophetic word, that was good this morning. The Lord was speaking this morning. That, that was awesome. And uh, I, I liked how he worded it. Uh, I have need of you. Jesus went, right? And so it's our job to pick up the mantle and continue the work, right? Um, Lord, help me know where to go here. I, I just got a lot going on. I... I've, in, in the youth, we've been talking about end times. Not, not really getting really deep in. Just, just, I'm just wanting to make them aware how close they are to the end. And the last time I spoke, I sort of talked about how things have changed just in the last 20 years. Maybe just turn me down a little bit or take a little trouble out or something. It's, And um, I, I was sharing with my dad. I, I saw Sith Roth had someone. I, sometimes some of the people Sith has are a little out there for me. But anyways, the, the one gentleman he had on there the other day, he was quoting sources that I've heard secular people quoting. So I, I sort of took him as credible because I've heard financial advisor talking about how the central banks are um, scheming or, or their agenda is to drive down the American dollar in order that they can institute the new one world order world currency because they can't institute it while they're still a dominant currency, right? And I've heard econ other economics um, specialists or um, experts speak of this. And, and there was a gentleman on the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, coming out in the open right on public television in Britain talking about this is their agenda, the run down the American dollar so that they can institute the one world currency. And, uh, and this gentleman went on to say, they're, they've instituted a date of 2018. That's only five years from now. Isn't that something? Five years. They're, 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 it, the wheels are in process. The gears are turning here. And, and so I, I, my gears are turning going, well, how are we going to do this, Lord? You know? How, how are we going to manage this? How's the church going to manage through this? Now, maybe we'll get raptured out of here. I don't know before all this takes place. I don't know. But in the meantime, my gears are turning, thinking, how, how are we going to survive this without taking the mark? Um, this gentleman quoted Ralph Nader. I don't know if you guys know Ralph Nader. If you know the name, he, he was a gentleman who's run as an independent for president a couple times. And he was quoted as saying that he's already seen, the government in the U.S. has already got... Um, Buildings and the material set up to institute the mark of the beast. And the, and the gentleman was saying, this man is not a born-again Christian by any means, Ralph Nader. <laughs> but yet he was using the terms of the mark of the beast. He, he recognized that um, they believe through the new health care system that they will implement the mark of the beast. There will come a, 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 a climax here in the next few years that you'll have to choose whether to take the mark in order that the government might save us or rely on God, right? Uh, we're, we're going down the slope here real quick. Things are accelerating at, at uh, massive rates, right? And I've been just, I've been just so, I've been sharing that with the youth that your time is it's coming here and you guys need to be grounded. You need to know what you stand for. The word says in the last days that even the elect will be drawn away. And so uh, I've been processing this, and I've been, I've been just thinking about it. And, but uh, I was reminded when I was sharing with the youth, the scripture Jesus said, but in the last days, I also will step it up. I will step it up too, the Lord said, and I'll pour out my spirit. And uh, we need that. <sighs> Whew. Whew. <sighs> 
we're going to need it to survive. Amen? And so we, we've been studying about the early book of Acts. I, I get studying elsewhere, but I always come back to the book of Acts. I'm drawn to this book, The Accounts of the Early Church. Because this is how we're supposed to be, right? And I keep saying to myself, there's something missing in Jason's life that I'm not... I'm still missing something. You know, when I read the accounts, the amazing accounts of the early church, the early apostles, and you've got to understand... These, these apostles walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Yet when it came to the climax of in the garden, what did they do? They scurried off, didn't they? One even fled naked. He was so scared. He left his clothes behind. So the account tells us, right? And Peter denies Christ before a servant girl. In spite of all they've seen, in spite of all they've witnessed, think about it. Peter, Peter was in the boat and saw Jesus walking on the water. Peter himself even got out of the boat and walked on water for, for a short time, right? But that wasn't enough to change him, was it? It wasn't enough to give him the boldness. Remember, I, I remember a year or so, I, we talked about that, about um, that word boldness and how the, the Pharisees, when they were examining Peter and John, remember when they were hauled into the court or after they healed that gentleman? And we're going to come to that today, Acts chapter 3 and 4. And it says that they took note. Um, where is that? I'm, I'm just, I'm, Acts chapter 3. The Amplified it says in uh, chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness and unfettered eloquence. And I looked up that word unfettered. I looked up the word fettered. And I wrote it down here in my Bible and it says, It's a chain or shackle, impediment and restriction, and to restrain. But the word here is unfettered. So that the Pharisees have noted that these men are not chained. They're not shackled. They're not imp- there's no impediments. There's no restriction. There's no restraining in these men. You can't shut them up. <laughs> it's just continually flowing. There's an awful contrast. Before Peter, Peter was denying. He knew Christ. He was falling at a distance. That's what the count says, that when, when they led Jesus away, it said that him and John followed at a distance. They weren't standing beside Jesus as he was being dragged in. There's a change here in this man, isn't there? To the point where when at the fire, when he was warming himself, and the girl was questioning, you're a Nazarene. You're, you're with Jesus. And, and the third time, it says that Peter began to call down curses. He was so emphatic, emphatic that he wasn't a part of Jesus' clan. And now, only a short time later, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, after the day of Pentecost, they can't shut him up. That, that, that's, that's their testimony. That's the testimony of the very men who are examining him. They can't shut him up. He, he's, he's unchained. He's unshackled. He's unrestricted. You can't restrain him. Um... Lord help me. I, I, there's just so much going on here. I, I had an inter- interesting week. Um, uh, I went to visit a gentleman on business. I had a, a reason to visit him for a minute, and uh, we got talking, and uh, he got talking about, I, I don't know how we got there. All of a sudden, he got talking about the old United Church in, in our community, just north of where we live, had closed down. And he got talking about, it was a shame the churches, and we were talking about how times are changing. And he, he was talking about a shame that a lot of these churches are closing down. And even though he doesn't really go, he still thinks it's of value. And oh, I, oh, I know. He, he was encouraged me to go and uh, start dragging this one guy to church because he needs to get out. And <laughs> I need to, have, uh, need to give, a, give him a positive outlook on life. He, he's always on a downer. And so he was encouraging me to go and, you know, he's all right, but go and take him to church and get him out and, you know, shine him up a bit. And, but he got talking about the United Church, and, and I, again, forgive me on the video, or I'm not putting down the United Church here this morning. Many of the mainline churches, their main problem they're facing is all these churches that are empty now. That is the number one problem that church, the denominations face now, is all these rural churches are, are, are dying. 
And so, so now they have all these buildings sitting there. And so that's, their main, that, that's the biggest problem is what to do with these empty buildings now, with these congregations of 10 people. And, um, and I often ponder about this work here. I'm saying, Lord, that can be us in another generation. The, the old mainline churches were, were spirit filled churches at one time at, at the beginning, right? And the Presbyterian church where we went to, they always had the symbol of the burning bush mounted at the front of the church. But somewhere along the line, we, we've departed. They departed from that, they've forgotten that. And, and, and we can be there too. If we don't go back to the roots, if we don't go back to the Holy Spirit, um, Second Corinthians or First Corinthians chapter one is it? First Corinthians chapter two. I, I just want to quickly read that, and then I'll come back to my story. First Corinthians chapter two, In verse four, and, and, and this is. Paul preaching here. And then King James says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And in verse 5 it says, That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he's saying here, I... You gotta understand, Paul. Of many of the people, Paul could stand up and 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 carry on a great debate with anybody, right? He was he was a Pharisee coming up through the pipes. He he was well learned. He wasn't like Peter and John, where we read in the early scripture where it said that they were unlearned men, but yet they took note that there was obviously something different about these guys. Paul, on the other hand, was trained in in the old school of of the scriptures. Yet Paul recognizes here it's not about words. It's more than words. It's going to require more than words to win people over to Christ. And he's saying, I didn't come preaching and being a a slick oil salesman, right? But he's saying, it was more than that. It was by demonstrating, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And... uh, I'm not a fork here. Lord, help me. (laughs) And so I've been pondering this. We need... In Acts chapter 1, it says that Jesus said... In verse 8, And you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. What for? In order that you would be a witness. He didn't come upon you so you could speak in tongues. He didn't come upon you so you could lay on the floor and have a good laugh. He didn't come upon you to do whatever, but it was so that you could be a witness, that you could get a backbone and come out of the closet and be a witness. And Lord, do we need that backbone today? Um, But as I've been processing this here, I wonder if witness means more than just testifying. And the thoughts going through my head, it's twofold. What does the word witness mean to you? Like, I'm thinking about in the court of law, when they bring forth the witnesses, the evidence that they, they profess to and come forward with 
They are, they are often, number one, eyewitnesses, right? Which, which means what? What's that? They, they were at the scene of the crime, right? Or they were at the scene of the accident. They, they saw it with their eyes. They heard it with their ears. And the thing I love about when you read through the book of Acts, I don't know how many times, but it's, it's numerous times, when they seen and heard, the crowds came. You know, the apostles wasn't just running around preaching. It was twofold. There was preaching, but there was also miraculous signs. And so when the people seen and heard, they were drawn. When they seen and heard, it, it, it's twofold. And so to me, a witness can't be just heard, but he has to be seen, demonstrating, Right? And I can't help but wonder if, if we've forgotten the being seen and demonstrating the power of God and the world's just hearing us. Right? They're just hearing us, but they're not seeing us in action. They're not seeing us demonstrating the power of God. In Mark chapter 16, I'll just quickly turn there. We call it the Great Commission. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. It says, the title of mine here, it says, and Jesus gives the Great Commission. And what's the word commission? What's the first thought that comes to you when you hear commission? Okay, good. Assignment. You guys are too spiritual. I'm thinking of a used car salesman. I'm thinking of the used car salesman. Commission. Right? Pushy. Selling something that isn't as good as what they say it is. Right? Think about it. Misrepresenting the truth. Trying to sell me a lemon. And you know what? We in the church have been like a used car salesman. We've been misrepresenting the truth. Misrepresenting the product that we're trying to sell here. Instead of letting the product speak for itself, we've been trying to paint her up, make her look better than what she really is. You know what I'm saying? We're smooth, dressed good, look good, trying to present something. But the reality is the product is so good, we don't have to go there, Right? Jeremy said in an article this week talking about how the church is trying to be cool to the world. And the people aren't staying. The people are still leaving. Because the world doesn't want cool. They just want Jesus. And we're too busy trying to dress up and try to paint something that, because we're dead, we need CPR. We need Jesus in us and bring us back to life, right? But commission means, as my brother was saying, the way I see it, it means authorized. When you've been commissioned, you've been authorized by the power of be with power and right. Right? Isn't that cool? Jesus has commissioned you. He has authorized you to carry on the family business with power and right. And so, in youth group, we've been talking about power. What's power mean in the Greek, guys? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, dynamite. So he's authorized you with dynamite power and right. Exousia. That's the other part of power, right? Let's just show... I want to show you guys what dynamite power is. I've got a little video here. We were, I was waiting for the countdown here. And <laughs> That's almost good enough to watch again, isn't it? 
Just back it up a little. You notice the birds are singing? It's just all nice and peaceful. That's done my power. That, do you notice how much I jerked? Just, I'm, I, I can still feel the vibration in my chest. And I was like 200 yards away. And I knew it was coming, but yeah, I still wasn't prepared for that power. The vibration just hit the chest and just, I can't. George, you were there, weren't you? It was something, wasn't it? That vibration. Even though I was that far away, I could feel it right in my chest. And you saw me. I was like, whoa. I couldn't keep focus. That's power. And that's what the writer's talking about. And you shall receive power. That kind of power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. For what? And again, we think it's, it's just to be a witness. To testify and demonstrate the power of Christ. To get a backbone and come out of the closet. The world's coming out of the closet and declaring who they are, right? They're not ashamed of who they are. Why are we ashamed of who we are? Anyways, back to my story. The brother here, um, I was talking to this brother. He, again, he's not born again. He's not saved. Though he knows where I am at. So we got talking, and, and he, he was just talking about how it was a shame that this old church was closing down. And I said, but he he feels I'm on the I'm I'm on the right track because he knows I play guitar and he knows, you know, we're, we're catering to the young people. And I've told I've had ministers from the United Church ask me to come in and play. And I said it's going to take more of me and the guitar because I'm not that great of a guitar player to begin with. Because that's not going to keep them. It's going to take that dynamite power. Because it, it just as Paul was right. It, their faith can't rest in my guitar playing. The next generation's faith can't rest in my guitar playing, drum playing, cool music. It's got to rest in something bigger and better than that. It's got to rest in that dynamite power. Something real and tangible. So you know what I did to this gentleman? I began to apologize to him. I began to apologize to him for not presenting the full gospel to him. Think about that. I began to apologize to him that because he knows where I'm at. But I said, you know what? I said, you know what? Our church can, can be where that church is if we don't get our game on. And to start presenting that, that I might power, that his faith will rest in the real thing. I said, if you got a, a medical, uh, help me out, Shelby here, a diagnosis, and you were given six months to live, and if I came up to you and prayed to you and you got healed, that would change your life. That's tangible gospel. And I apologize that I haven't presented that to you to, the, to this day yet. I use the word yet. We need to get real. He has given us that. The prophetic word that our brother shared a month ago about it's yours for the taking is still resonating in here. It's still going in between these years and just bouncing back and forth. It's up to us. We need to jump ball and jump for it and grab it and get it. Right? It's ours for the taking. But it's like the others. But he, the scripture says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently. Diligent means you don't have time to look to the left or right. You're just focused. Right? So anyways, I apologize to that gentleman. But that led to me testifying of my knee, right? I, you've all heard my testimony about my knee, right? Check out that knee. <laughs> I had bursitis in this knee, inflammation below my kneecap. And my, my wife and kids can testify. I looked like I had two kneecaps at the end of the day, most days when I come home. It looked like I had another kneecap down here. So I went and saw the doctor, and they diagnosed it, and called it, and labeled it something, and told me to pop an ibuprofen and carry on. 
right? That's what they do. Pop a pill and cope with it. I was leading worship here back in January. I believe it was January. It was back early January. And the Holy Spirit said, how long are you going to put up with that? Right? I'm up here trying to encourage you and encourage you in the faith. And the Holy Spirit saying, how long are you going to put up with that? The Holy Spirit does have humor. Because my God's not a coper. He's a healer. He doesn't do bondle jobs. He just, in the name of Jesus, that's... Yeah, we're trying to bondle stuff and patch stuff up and cover it up and make it look good. Instead, I'm just going to the power, the dynamite power, and saying, in the name of Jesus. Right? We need that. So I felt good after that conversation. I don't know where that all came from. Sowed some seed. Shared a testimony. I was a witness of the healing power of God. I possessed that in my body, and so I just began to tell him about it. And so we need to step up and embrace the the dynamite power. He is well able. And I praise the Lord, the words that came forth this morning. That was good. That was encouraging. We're right on track. We need to keep pressing in. Keep seeking. Because he says he's going to reward us. This place maybe doesn't look that full this morning. Look around. What is the problem? If we don't embrace that dynamite power, we might as well, we're going to be just like the United Church, short order. Yeah, we've got drums and guitars, but yeah, who cares? We can drag out the organ too. And <laughs> the difference maker is the Holy Spirit. And man, we need the Holy Spirit to breathe on us, breathe CPR and bring us back to life. Thank Jeremy for doing up this picture. This is awesome. Shelby was doing the Holy Ghost jig when she saw the picture. I want you to get a picture. I want you to get that picture. Empty. I see chairs hanging on this wall. Wouldn't that be a trophy case? Not our trophy case, but his trophy case. Wouldn't that be something? I ran to Brother McPhail down at youth camp. He just came back from Wales, where the revival was going on. And when he was sharing, I was just moved at what he was sharing about how the brother got up of the wheelchair and he began to pick it up. <laughs> Picked up his wheelchair, walked around, and revival broke out. He was just, when he was sharing that, I was just moved by the man, we need that. We need that. Can I just read the account of Acts 3 and 4 to you? I just want to read it quickly to you. It's just come to me. I remind you, back the first year, the Lord gave me that scripture of, it's not by strength, nor by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not by strength, nor by power. The writer's speaking of my own strength, my own will. But it's by his spirit, says the Lord. So in Acts chapter 3, it says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in each day. He was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful, so he could ask them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up and stood on his feet and began to walk, then walking, leaping, and praising God, and he went into the temple with them. Isn't that crazy? 
You got, you got a picture of this. They're going to church. So it'll be like Bob sitting at the gate. He, he, he's almost a fixture of the gate. Every Sunday we, we're driving. Hey, Bob. It says he was, he was put there every day, right? Everyone knew who he was. Everyone would chip him a quarter and walk on by and carry on with life, right? Yeah, here, here comes the two new apostles. Something different about them. Hey, think about it. Everyone knew who this guy was. He, he's been dealing with, he's been coping with this for 40 years. Right? But I, I just love this. It says in verse 9, here, here we go. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. <laughs> There's our twofold, right? Seeing and hearing. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the, the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. And verse 11 says, They all rushed out in amazement to Psalm's colony where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Isn't that awesome? Instantly, crowd. People are attentive. They listen. Why? Yeah. Because they've seen, often they say uh, testimonies of when Jesus healed, we have never seen anything like this before. Remember that? Whenever Jesus would heal something, we've never seen anything like this before. You possess that power in you today. Verse 12. This is interesting. Just know this. In verse 12, Peter saw his opportunity and dressed the crowd. Pastor, last week was talking about opportunities. Here's the scoundrel that was so embarrassed of Jesus not too many days earlier in front of a little servant girl that he would run and deny knowing Jesus. And now he's seen his opportunity before crowds of thousands and sees that opportunity. Lord, we need that boldness, don't we? To step through that window of opportunity So in verse 16, it says, Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And everyone, and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. So go to chapter 4. I, I just love this account. It's just, it's so entertaining. Isn't it entertaining? <laughs> Listen to this. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests and the captain of the temple guards and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people, through Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it, so that the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men. I, I underlined that because it said, but, in spite of... In spite of what happened, in spite of them being arrested, there was salvations already beginning because of their witness. You see that? And so on Wednesday, I was speaking to the youth about um, youth camp blues, right? Woo! Oh, crash. Yeah, I'm going to serve Jesus. Woo! Next week, where, where is everybody? Hey, what's going on? That's not Bible. Right? That's not Bible. Youth camp, woo! No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go to church today. These guys are throwing to jail. Hey, my sister's here this morning. All right, all right. Bang on. All right, awesome. It's not Bible. These guys were thrown in jail. They weren't. Well, let's read it. Let's carry on. These guys didn't lose any vigor here one night in jail. <laughs> this is so awesome. We've got to read this. 
So in spite of them being thrown in jail, 2,000 more people are added to their, the church here. Not counting women and children, so who knows how many... It could be 10, 15,000. Do the math. I don't know. This is just men they're counting here. So the next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law let, met in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas and John Alexander and the other relatives of the high priest. And they brought the two disciples and demanded, By what power or whose name have you done this? Well, they must have didn't hear Jesus' commission, right? Back Mark 16? Right? What's commission mean? Authorize with power and, and right. Jesus got us covered. He's given us the, the sheriff badge and the pistol, right? Power and the, the authority, the badge. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's the difference maker, isn't it? Without the Holy Spirit, he was denying Jesus. Now filled with the Spirit. Take no... Peter doesn't back down. Rulers and elders of the people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for the crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? <laughs> no, we don't. Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God has raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the Scripture, where it says the stone you builders rejected has now become the capstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter. And aren't we all? The testimony of the very men that want to kill Peter are now saying, this guy's bold. This guy's just unfettered. Unrestrained. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. Clearly, the man that was healed was put in jail with them too. I, I just noticed that there. Because I doubt they would have invited him to the, to the meeting. So clearly they threw Peter and John and the crippled man in jail for the night. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred amongst themselves. And then verse 16. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign. And everyone in Jerusalem knows about it. And that's basically the title of my message today. We can't deny the very men that wanted to snuff these guys out, the very men that wanted to, that were jealous of these men and, and hated these men because of their association with Jesus, their own test, their own witness of these men were, we can't deny it. We can't debate that. We can't enter into an intelligent argument about that. The facts are the facts. The truth is the truth. And I... We can bait evolution and science and all that all, all day long, but my knee, they can't debate. Right? But what should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign. And everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any farther, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. <laughs> so they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, 
Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? And in verse 20, this, this one I just love. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Think about it. We've been passing Bob by the gate for 40 years. Flipping him a quarter every time we drive by. Here. Think about it. For 40 years, we've been driving by Bob every day. Going to our prayer meeting at 3 o'clock. And then all of a sudden, we see him standing beside us. And he's not being quiet. Read the account. He was... He was leaping and jumping and screaming and shouting. He was making quite a ruckus. Everyone knew him because everyone drove by him every day to go to church. We were pretty religious. We went to church every day back then for prayer meeting. So we knew Bob quite well. What would that do to you? Revival starts within. And Lord, we need to be revived. Our faith needs to be rekindled. Just think about it. I, I, I said to that, that gentleman I met with, what would that do to you in your faith if you got healed of cancer? It's no longer, this is no longer a book with stories. Right? This is no longer grandma's Bible that, and her stories that she believed. Right? But this becomes tangible, real. You know what I'm saying? It's no longer just a leather-bound book that grandma used to always preach out of. Right? It's real. It's tangible. It's made a difference in my life. And our youth need that. When I was speaking about creating a, an ark, remember? A couple months ago, I was, it's more than money. We need to create an atmosphere in here that they can set their faith and rest their faith on evidence, proof. That's the problem is we've departed from the demonstration of the power of God, and so our kids were resting their faith on stories, resting their faith on drums and guitars and, and trying to be cool, and resting their faith on mom and dad's faith instead of them witnessing and, de- and seeing the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? We, we've got to change. We've we got to get back to the Bible. Or we're just going to be like the, the mainline churches closing up shop. And what did Jesus say? If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. Because you're no good to him either. He says, I have need of you. That, that, that was the Lord's word this morning. I have need of you, but if you're lukewarm and just trying to be a used car salesman and try to paint it up, my gospel, instead of just tapping into the real thing, getting with the program. Amen. We need it, don't we? I, I need it. Jason needs something here. These guys had something. I, I tell you, jail said, go back to the same spot. These guys had something. And I need a drink of it or something. Right? We, we need to get, we need to tap into what's going on. Lord, we need you. That old course just goes through my mind all the time. When I'm in the tractor driving, Lord, I need you. My crops need you. Lord, I need you. How am I going to have an impact in this community? Man, people are hard nowadays. Man, we're hard on Peter, but man, I'm, I'm no better than Peter was. Man, I need to be unfettered. Unchained. We sing of freedom. What are we doing with it?
We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. We need to start testifying. Back in Mark and the commission, Jesus said, I will accompany those, work with, alongside the preaching of the word, the testifying. And too often we're not even testifying. So probably we don't qualify for the demonstration of the power if we're not opening our mouths. Right? Too often I'm silent. I just I get talking about something that's not right. I'll, I'll just back up and excuse myself from that discussion. Right? I need a backbone. I need the Holy Spirit to stiffen me up. Right? What do you think? We need to get a new vision, right? What can the Lord do with us if we would just something's got to change. Jason's got to change, right? Because he's well able. God is the constant in the mathematical equation. Jason just has to show up and get himself in the equation, and some great things can happen, right? I just need to get with the program. When my sister was crying out to the Lord this morning, repentance isn't a bad thing. That. That witness with me this morning. That, uh, repentance isn't a bad thing. Uh, when I was at youth camp uh, one night, and uh, they were singing, they were singing that one song, and 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 the one part talks about opening the heavens, and they're crying out, and they're crying, but it, it almost felt like we met resistance, and I, I felt my spirit. I I perceived the Lord was saying. Re- he, I, I saw the story of the prodigal son, the father. And, and the one brother did start talking about the love of the father. But, but the father didn't run all the way to the pig pen and drag the son by the scruff of the neck and drag him back home, did he? He was looking out for him, but the son had to come to his senses, get up out of the pig pen and start heading back home. Right? And, and so I had... I. I just began to repent myself. I, I felt there was a call of repentance. Right? Repentance isn't a bad thing. And so when my sister was crying out to the Lord this morning, repent, that, that was good. That was, that was pushing us through. That was breakthrough. That was just witnessing with my heart this morning. So I, I just opened the altars this morning. If you need prayer for healing, we're going to stand with you. And we'll keep crying on the Lord. Uh, I'm believing for my aunt in her wheelchair. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when. But we're going to keep crying on the Lord. My brother here is, you know, he's going in for surgery. But we're believing that the Lord can do greater things in his body. Amen. And we'll stand with them and believe. Because he is well up. The Lord hasn't changed. We just need to get with the program. Blessings, Bob. So the altar's open this morning. Maybe you just want to repent, cry on the Lord. Diligently seek him this morning. So, Father, I, I just bow before you and I thank you Lord that you are desiring I thank you Lord that you've spoken to us this morning clearly that you are desiring of us you are calling for us you have need of us as much as we have need of you thank you Lord thank you Lord that in spite of us You're still willing to use us. So Holy Spirit, Father, Jesus, we just cry on you this morning that we are in great need. 
we are desiring to, to add a new chapter to the book of Acts, Lord. That in these last days you declare that you will pour out your spirit upon your sons and your daughters, upon your men servants and maid servants. So, Lord, we just say, have your way. Have your way in the, our midst here today, Father. Would you just pour out your spirit again, Lord? I know you've done it in the past. I know you've done it here recently. I know even, uh, we thank you, Lord, for the times that you have met us and poured your spirit. Do it again, Lord. Fill us up again, Lord. Give us boldness, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We just love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you that you've commissioned us, that you've equipped us. Thank you, Lord. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.